I'm at FIT's Fashion Culture Series. Tonight it is my pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Wissinger, who will present her book, This Year's Model, Fashion, Media, and the Making of Glamour. After the presentation, we will have a short Q&A session, followed by a book signing upstairs. Elizabeth Wissinger is an Associate Professor of Sociology at BMCC, City University of New York, and an Associate Professor of Fashion Studies at the CUNY Graduate Center. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth. Hello. Um, can you all hear me? Even if I stand back like this? I gotta stand like this, right? Okay. Welcome. I'm so happy to see you all here. I always love having the opportunity to share my work and talk about these ideas. I find them interesting, and I hope you will too. Um, so, why don't we get started? Uh, this is the book, Fashion Models and the Making of Glamour. Um, yay! And in fact, that's art by a former classmate of mine in college, who I found totally by accident. It's a wonderful story, I'll tell you later. Um, so, uh, today, we are going to be talking about fashion models, glamour labor, and the age of the blink. And these are concepts that I hope will become clear to you as I speak about them this evening. So, let's look at what we've written here. Um, let's start with fashion models, shall we? Whether you hate to love them or love to hate them, fashion models are a key element in popular culture. Their work is embroiled in debates about controversial bodily ideals. Here we have some models who were accused of being way too skinny at the Victoria Beckham Fashion Show recently. They are at the center of struggles for social power and acceptance. And here we have the grand poobahs of adjudicating fashionable inness or outness, Andre and Anna. And they figure prominently in conflicts between men and women. And this is um, children. Cover your ears. This is accused sex predator with a camera, Terry Richardson, <laughs> who's been known to do some untoward things at fashion shoots. You don't have to cover your eyes, tears. <laughs> you just cover your ears. Um, and so he has a bad boy reputation that kind of goes along with all of the issues that fashion models stir up when we bring up the topic. So needless to say, fashion modeling is a hot topic that pushes many buttons. For all its glamour, modeling's dark underbelly has been well documented. For instance, there's been, there have been many documentaries, but this particular one girl model was very striking. It was about going to scout in the wilds of Siberia um, and bringing teenage girls to somewhat relatively deplorable conditions in Japan to work as models. Um, there's a book that just came out recently, and it's called Jamais Assez Maigre, which I believe means never skinny enough. And it is by French model Victoire Dozer. Um, and it is her account of her struggle to keep her health and her sanity under what she claims are inhumane conditions working as a model. Um, and debate center on whether images of sent, oh, sorry, I'm just going to see if I can read what I wrote here. Um, debate center on whether images of skinny models cause eating disorders or damage young girls' self-esteem. And these debates have been ongoing, especially since the 1970s, which is a significant point that I will use to illustrate my argument today. So what's fascinating about what's happening now with regard to models is how many models or former models are speaking out in ways they have never done before. Sarah Ziff is a model who made a documentary, Picture Me, and then formed an organization, the Model Alliance. And the Model Alliance is aimed at agitating for better working conditions for models, using existing child labor laws to protect teenage models, make sure they get enough to eat and they get let off work on time and that sort of thing. Um, I just saw an interview with a model, Charlie Howard, whose criticisms of the industry went viral. And she has become a sort of spokesperson on behalf of the changing changing the dominant images of models. Um, another former model, or still model, artist Natalie White became radicalized and is now a social activist and artist dedicating her life to promoting equal rights for women by means of promoting the Equal Rights Amendment for the Constitution. Uh, and she is pictured here in the red t-shirt by photographer Renee Tourier, and she's actually with us this evening, so we might be able to hear from her later. <laughs> Um, and recently in the news has been Alexia Palmer, who made headlines for suing Trump models for breaking labor laws. Um, so will this controversy in which these 
um, fighters for equal rights or fighters for improving modeling, this controversy in which they are engaged, will it bring about real change? Is gender inequality solely to blame? Would dialing back rampant consumerism help? What are they up against? Looking at these issues as a sociologist and a person without a cursor, <laughs> let's just, I'll take a breath, and then the cursor will come back. Oops, sorry guys. Oh, there it is. Cursor, you naughty thing, come back. Okay, so I know what I am anyway. I'm a sociologist. <laughs> So I just want to make sure I get this for you straight, though, because this is really important to setting up the argument. So looking at these issues as a sociologist, media and communication scholar, and feminist techno theorist, I dug into the roots of these controversies about the fashionable ideal's social power and found that what's going on is actually extremely complex and presents no simple solution. It doesn't mean there isn't one, but it's not a simple one. So to unearth these complexities, I talked to dozens of models, photographers, stylists, casting agents, model booker agents, and agency heads. I went to fashion shows, model parties. I went to castings and photo shoots and fashion weeks. I worked for somebody who's in the audience for, as a casting assistant at a production company. I called on my experience as an amateur model for which I was never paid, but once in a while there was a photograph taken of me where I was modeling. Um, I followed the news, combed li library archives, I looked at images, websites, I read novels about models, I watched movies and television shows about them, and I consulted numerous how-to-model how to books from the 1950s to the present. This research forms the backbone of the ideas that I will be discussing today, and this took several years. So. It's not like I did that all at once. So what I found when I looked at 150 years of modeling's history is that the fashionable ideal is not just about being nice to look at. It is caught up in the economics of images and the machinery for making them. This history shows that shifts in dominant forms of making pictures from snapshots to celluloid, from the boob tube to swiping right and left, represent, or roughly parallel economic shifts from manufacturing widgets to manufacturing moods to manufacturing biological states, which is something we can get into in the Q&A. So I put it in the book, I like alliteration, from the gaze of cinema to the glance of television, and finally to the blink of the internet and social media, these are eras in ways of making pictures that roughly parallel broad shifts in economy and industry, and these shifts deeply affected the dominant fashionable ideal. So for instance, in the current moment of internet and social media, we are witnessing the tinderization of everything from sex to politics. This is a regime that runs on split-second gut decisions based on nonverbal reactions to how images strike people. Who has time for reasoned analysis, reflection, and thoughtfulness? It's swipe right, swipe left, and get on with it. This is what I call the age of the blink where images and information are moving so fast, wait, don't blink, you'll miss it. So there is no longer a one-to-one -one correspondence between seeing a particular image and having a specific reaction to it. We live in a hyper-connected haze where lines between cause and effect are almost impossible to draw. In this environment, claiming that modeling causes anorexia or misses key reasons why the power of the fashionable image, sorry, let's say that again, um, and I'm not saying that there's no correlation between modeling and eating disorders, but saying that's the only thing that's going on misses some key reasons why the power of the fashionable image is so pervasive and so persistent. To reiterate, the fact that men rule and people like to buy a lot of stuff are, of course, involved in making the model image, but some of its tenacious power, its stick to is caught up in beliefs supporting ideas about right living and what it takes to be a good worker. So let me explain. And here we just, I'd like to note that on the left here we have what's called a carte de visite, which was a visual form of a calling card that became popular in the 1800s. And it was also a mode through which, a style through which young girls found some small measure of fame who weren't actresses or movie stars. And so in a, in a sense, it was like one of the first Instagram type 
uh, settings for it because they would actually pose in the clothing and positions of the stars of the day that they admired. And then, of course, we have the selfie, which I think is really interesting to see it and framed in the Pinterest frame, um, and the faceless style of selfie, which was popular for quite some time, where the, the phone would hide the face and only the body would show. So in the age of rampant selfies, it is hard to imagine the shame felt by 18-year-old Abigail Robertson when she became the unknowing poster girl for Franklin Mills Flower. When she innocently granted a portrait photographer permission to make a lithograph of her likeness, she had no idea it would appear in thousands of posters and magazine advertisements to sell flower. She was mortified and angry. Modeling for advertisements was not something ladies of polite society did. She sued the company, claiming she had become an object of derision. Her jeering neighbors caused her mental distress for which she demanded $15,000 in damages, which was a princely sum in 1902. Her lawsuit of that same year broached the idea that a photograph might violate a person's right to privacy. Her lawsuit started a chain reaction that kick-started modeling as a paid job. Consequently, a person's look, and this is an important concept to kind of follow through with today, a person's look became a thing that could be bought and sold. But models were not the sole owners of their images at first. In the early days, they were cogs in an image-making machine, just like workers on an assembly line. You get enough of them going, doing the same thing at the same time, and you have a product. Let me explain. In the early days of modeling, being a model meant being a model for a particular house. So there were lots of different design houses that had their attendant look. And the French couturier Paul Poiret, for instance, preferred his models rounded and plumped, plump. So as he explained in one of his many biographies, Paulette was for a long time the one I preferred, with round arms and rounded shoulders. She was plump and elegantly rolled as a cigarette. And you can see that she doesn't have a classic model body. Um, I don't think it's just the dress that's forming the curve on the front of her. Uh, torso. So early models' bodies were corseted into the shape that was in fashion to produce a uniform appearance and silhouette. They did not engage in, a, in the total exposure of every inch of skin and every aspect of one's life with the concomitant demands for high-level grooming and self-branding that models engage with today. Early models worked to produce the uniform signature look of the designer for whom they worked. So for Poiret's tour of Europe in 1911, pictured here, his mannequins wore a traveling uniform of blue serge dresses and beige plaid coats. Each model, similar in height and carriage, presented a graphic figure, amplifying effect of the Poiret image six times over. And you can see they're all dressed almost identically. He's the one who gets to wear the leopard print because he's the star, right? So they were just the adjuncts to his stardom. And fast forward a few several, many years, uh, whether on the runway or off, crafting the model image was the norm in the industry. Even when they started working for more than one designer, models' public lives were still staged and scripted by their agents. The model's look was an agency affair. So mid-century model manager John Robert Powers, the master of publicity, manufactured his model's looks and image very carefully. He loved publicity. He always said, oh, if my models get attention, it's not something I did. But in fact, he was totally working it all the time. Um, and he loved the sort of stunts like this one where his models were going to the Orange Bowl. So they had many opportunities to be photographed. And at the time, flying on a jet plane was like a major big deal. And they had their own jet. I mean, imagine if like some models were going to the moon. That was how exciting it was. I'm a little bit far off. It wasn't that exciting. But it was very exciting to jet travel. It was very glamorous. And they had their own p uh, plane. And I don't know if you can see on the door there, there's a woman's head coming out of a rose on the back, right? So he actually branded all of the Powers models. They were long-stemmed American beauties. And so his long-stemmed American beauties got into their long-stemmed American beauty plane, and they flew to Florida, and the cameras were clicking. Um, and this was his way of producing the image of models. And you see, I think it's important to note that we have almost identical girls in a row in a series in a similar manner to a popular form of the day. 
So Power's aesthetic was constant, consonant with the prevalent values of uniformity and standardization epitomized both by factory line production and the series of images made into a whole by the gaze of the technology of film. Now, if you think about that for a minute, so film is, looks like it's a continuous movement, but it's a bunch of still images that are strung together by a machine. So these values were idealized by an image of identical beauties in a row, moving in lockstep position, embodied by the Tillers girls, the Rockettes, and Busby Berkeley's, Busby Berkeley's creations for the cinema. So we have the various kick lines, and then you can see, I hope, that there is a real visual link between the factory floor and what was going on in entertainment, or what was called by some scholars the mass ornament of the day. So cinema is a technology of editing, suturing, crafting, and artifice. It is an imaging style of the long look. It is not live or unfiltered. It is the product of engineering and a little make-believe. As these cinematic values permeated the culture, they affected not only how models were managed, but the look of the fashionable ideal itself. Consider the mid-century fashion model. She is haughty, remote, elegant, refined formed in the crucible of Hollywood glamour, the rarefied domain of haute couture, and the growing field of fashion photography, she was a complex creation indeed. I love these images, especially the one on the Look at her face. She's so refined. So these values inspired mid-century fashion photographers to stage dramatic scenes where elaborate set pieces such as yards and yards of tool or a gorgeous setting such as a Parisian boulevard were just as important as the models. And you can see, especially in this one on the right, that the model is just a graphic element among other graphic elements. And this is a cover of a magazine, which we don't usually see nowadays. You would not not see, in fact, it wouldn't be a model, it would be a celebrity. Mid-century fashion was also all about feats of mechanical engineering as well. I had to get my girdle picture in there. And I mean, look at her engineered physique here on the right. It's incredible. She's like a sculpture. And these feats informed the fashionable ideal, these feats of engineering. The ideal was about engineering the body to create a fashionable look. There was no need to work on one's physique. A basic figure could be waist cinched and bullet brought into submission. And one of the earliest existing modeling guides I consulted was the 1954 Secrets of Charm by, you guessed it, John Robert Powers. He wrote a bunch of books about how to be a model. He loved publicity, as I had said. So in his book, he had advice for the perfect model figure. How do you get it? Corsetry. In fact, he said, four factors always add up to the ideal figure. In order, they are proper diet, exercise, posture, and corsetry. That means putting on a corset or a waist cincher. And as we shall see, this attitude stands in stark contrast to the advice given models about how to achieve the fashionable look that was to come. So while the mid-century 1950s, fashion mannequins carefully manicure manicured and powdered perfection resonated with the highly edited world of Hollywood movies, the dawn of the television age brought the instantaneous moving image into our living rooms. This shift profoundly affected cultural ideals. Soon, fashion's haughty ice queens were replaced by the newly popular and approachable gamines, or cute girls. Models as ice queens? That's not a familiar image. Well, maybe to some of you. I'm sure there's a fashion historian somewhere in the room. Um, but in fact, we're going to admire this Balmain model for a moment. Her name was Bronwyn Poo, or Pug, Pug, I'm not sure, I'm not British. Um, as fashion historian Jean-Noël Leo has pointed out, in the cinematic era, the typical runway mannequin's demeanor, and I quote, was unsmiling, glacial, and immobile. Elegance was embodied by disdainful beauties who projected an air of distinguished boredom. Projecting haughty elegance, models did not jump or sashay down the runway. As fashion historian Caroline Evans observed, in the 1950s, model models slithered along the catwalk, at most pulling on or off a glove. They employed a specialized knowledge of how to construct a fashionable look, knowledge only available to fashion's initiates or insiders. But something happened in the social upheaval of the wild and crazy 1960s and 70s. In 1965, the fashion doyenne, Diana Vreeland, 
proclaimed the rise of a youth quake, a cultural movement where teenagers came to dominate the fashion and mod music scene. Can you imagine? You guys are almost teenagers and you would be in charge of it all. That's what was happening in the mid-1960s. The new values of the television screen combined with the sexual revolution and other political upheavals created a perfect storm that usurped the soigné, waist-cinched lady in a black silk dress and pearls that had typified the era. And this is a typical image of the era of the finely constructed physique, engineered and manufactured. And as I will now discuss, social media's current pull to be ever ready for one's close-up has its roots in this radical transition. As television displays cinema as the dominant imaging style, the screen was no longer at a distance in a dark movie hall, but up close and personal in one's living room. The images on display had changed too. They were lit from within, characterized by immediacy, transparency, the happening, the now. Crafted, construct and ele crafted and constructed elegance was tossed out in favor of immediate youthful exuberance. At designer Mary Quant's 1964 models, sorry, 1964 show, models didn't mince or glide. They danced, jumped, and ran down the runway, as Quant described it in her autobiography, Quant by Quant. And I quote, she's describing the, the fashion show. One girl carried an enormous shotgun. Another swung a dead pheasant triumphantly round her head. Perhaps too triumphantly, because the poor thing, which we had bought from Harrods across the road, thawed out in the middle of the, of the heat of the place, and blood began spurting out all over the newly painted walls, and even on some of the journalists. This style of presentation shocked and fascinated the fashion public. And you can see here that this is a fashion model in her go-go boots, who's in mid-jump dancing, and, and if you notice in the foreground, there's somebody playing, no doubt, rock and roll, live music, and if you look carefully in the back, it seems that there are kids about my daughter's age and some young children in the audience, very young, youthful, hip, lively setting. So Kant's publicity abandoned the cinematic in favor of the caught-on tape immediacy of television that was starting to dominate images in general. This shot was taken after Quant took her models on a whirlwind tour of several countries. As she explained, the girls worked nonstop for 10 days to translate the mood of her fashions into a visual fact. So they were translating mood into facts. And images from one of the many fashion shows they put on weren't immediate or visceral enough, apparently. Instead, at the end of the tour, the New York Herald Tribune phot photographers jostled into the girls' dressing room and found them, this is Quant's words, found them lying flat on the floor, absolutely out. The terrific pace had taken its toll. This was the picture the photographers took, she reported. It appeared the next morning in the papers. And in fact, this picture had been misfiled in the Queen's Library, and I had an extremely enterprising research assistant who dug it out and found it under the wrong title, because it was referred to in Quant's book, so we knew it existed, and we had a way to triangulate the date, and then we found the picture. She found the We found the picture. We found the picture. She's in the acknowledgments. Anyway. <laughs> so. The blurring of what sociologist Irving Goffman called backstage and frontstage behavior typified this time and is also evident in these publicity shots. These photos illustrate how in the rising dominance of the live nature of, of television, paparazzi were often quicker than a pose, leaving less time to craft a persona for the camera. Notice how the model is now a personality in her own right, not just a cookie cutter powers girl. And she seems to be caught by accident in her personal life, not in a staged photo stunt, although we know these are staged photo stunts. But at the time, they appeared natural and as if they were just caught by accident running through the hotel coat room or whatever. And you know, I always travel in a fringed leather mini dress, don't you? That's Twiggy up there, by the way. Um, and I believe this is Penelope Tree. So television's up-close-and-personal aesthetic came to the fore in a cultural climate where personality was a rising value in work and social life. As the dream to replace people with robots started to become a reality, and the need for people to be less robotic at work also emerged, it was a climate in which the economic value of personality began to take hold as the emerging service industries began to measure productivity in new ways. In the rise of speculative industries such as advertising, finance, and real estate, personality became highly valued in the ideal worker. No more pretty maids in a row. A mass-produced, highly edited model persona was out. Being somebody was in. 
um, and I don't I remember this from my dad actually having this book uh, but there were these personality at work books that became I'm sorry this one he had both um, that became more popular starting moving uh, past the 1970s and um, personality became a factor in modeling as well and who should have personality in spades but Twiggy so she's a model from the 1960s for those who were born five minutes ago. And girls like Twiggy and Penelope Tree typified the spontaneity inherent in the lit from, a, lit from within television image. Unlike the elegantly exclusive dames preceding her, Twiggy was everybody's model. Her popularity spreading far beyond fashion magazines. Her look was a significant departure from the former ways of styling the fashionable ideal and the new look was young, fresh-faced and accessible. According to model historian Bridget Keenan's account, Twiggy was everywhere. Car stickers said, forget Oxfam, feed Twiggy. Oxfam was an organization to feed the hungry of the world at the time. There were Twiggy clothes, Twiggy eyelashes, Twiggy dummies in shop windows and Madame Tussauds, so she had her own wax figure. Children carried Twiggy lunch boxes and played with Twiggy paper dolls. British teens imitated her hairdo and makeup style while adults starved themselves to achieve a Twig-like figure. And they wanted this energy of her fast-paced sense of fashion, the excitement of international travel, and endless youth was promised by Twiggy's look. And in fact, her career was fast-paced. She came on the scene, she took the world by storm, she was on a bunch of magazine covers, and her whole career was over in two or three years. So the importance of personality as an economic value is critical, crucial to understanding what happened in the rise of the regime of the glance of television. So we move from the gaze of cinema to the glance of television. It laid the groundwork for the system of glamour labor with which we contend today, a concept I theorized in the book and I will explain more about today. And as this story unfolded, my research uncovered how girls like Twiggy upped the ante. The general public became involved and started feeling pressures to be model perfect in the flesh, which replaced specialized knowledge of corsetry and other forms of artifice used to construct the model look. In the process, the glamour labor typical of modeling was sold to the general public as something everybody should try to do. So what is glamour labor? And why does it matter now? Glamour labor seems to be a phenomenon of the internet age, although I'm arguing in the book that it goes back more to the 60s and the dawn of television. We live in a selfie society where one's look and image are becoming as important to one's success as one's skill set. So the image seems to be trumping what you can actually do. And I hit on the idea of glamour labor when trying to explain modeling work. A key process in modeling is constructing one's look. The model look comprises the model's appearance in person and all the images in which the model has appeared. So the look marries the physical body and the virtual self into one. And what I have here is a picture of what models call comp cars, a composite of their various appearances in print and the di different kinds of looks that they can embody. Um, and it's interesting because at least when I was studying the industry, models were still delivering their comp cards in person. So you got the virtual image in print with the person right there in front of you all at once and that was the look of the model. So glamour labor describes the effort it takes to appear as fascinating and polished in person as one does in one's highly scripted, filtered and manipulated online life. It is both the body work to manage appearance in person and the online image work to create and maintain one's cool quotient, how hooked up, tuned in and in the know one is. When life work and body management bleed together, Glamour labor best describes the work to both project a fashionable image and to be that image in the flesh. So I have a handy diagram if anyone's interested. We can talk about it more later. We don't have to read everything on there, but basically it's trying to show you the kinds of work that people do on the body and the work in the, on the image that come together as glamour labor in the age of the blink. So to track the evolution of glamour labor, I consulted advice from the top aimed at those seeking to enter the inter inner sanctum of modeling and its ideals. But the memories of the model managers, agents, and bookers I spoke to only went back so far, so I went to the archives. Exploring modeling how-to books from the 1950s and 60s to the present day revealed a clear shift. That was a lot of fun to read those how-to books, let me tell you, especially from the 50s. The advice they gave sometimes was ridiculous. Eat one apple a day. Um, so exploring modeling how-to books revealed a clear shift. Modeling presented as a specialized practice changed to something everyone could and should try to do 
after the 60s and the 70s in these books. And in this transition, model experts' advice marking barriers to entry changed into instructions on how to do it with all comers welcome, just so long as they were willing to work hard enough. This opening up to everybody modeling instead of just some people being able to do it is crucial to understanding how the fashionable look of, sorry, this understanding is crucial to understanding the, the fashionable look of today in order to grasp why so many are fascinated by trying to achieve it and why the fashionable ideal holds so much cultural power. Up until the 60s, there had been a clear line between the more approachable and perhaps achievable bodies and looks of film stars and the remote, the remote aspirational look of the fashion model. So this is Theta Berra, a silent screen star who was very sexual and curvy and associated kind of more lower class ideals of beauty. And then this is a flapper who is very asexual and doesn't have any bumps or curves. Um, and then contrary what, to what a lot of people like to think about the 50s and we could talk about it in the Q&A, but in fact, on the left, we see the image of the ideal, beautiful body of the 50s, but on the right is what a lot of the fashion models of the 50s looked like. So they, in fact, were not an accessible, curvy ideal along the same lines of the movie stars. So until the 60s, from the model manuals I consulted at least, fashion modeling had been a rarefied domain only entered by a select few, and the model look was not for regular people. So until Twiggy started turning things around, and, and then we're supposed to look like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so, in fact, the rhetoric until this point said you either had it or you didn't. So here's some helpful tips from um, McGill's Your Future as a Model that came out in 1964. And it says, if you are a size 14, and always will be, and 14 wasn't actually that big back then because the sizes have changed, but it was still bigger than model size. Um, don't make yourself sick by dieting. Think about another career. So the language of the model manuals gradually began to imply, however, it was everybody's job to try to slim and tone and look their best. In other words, the way to achieve the fashionable ideal moved from corsets to crunches. Those are sit-ups. While the 1950s model manuals recommended a few stretches and maybe walking around with a book on your head, I always lose a lot of weight by doing that, um, and exercise was not really taken seriously. The idea of being at a gym rat or being a gym rat or being at the gym all the time was for at least for women was far in the future for many people. Don't you have one of those at home? Um, there was actually a broader cultural shift going on that the 70s model manuals were reflecting in which social values surrounding bodies and the technologies for getting a good one were shifting. So this is actually a picture of something called figurines, and those of you who are old enough in the audience might remember them. They were a diet food in which you basically ate like chocolate graham crackers to lose weight. Uh, I think you were supposed to eat those instead of actual food. Um, so in this time frame, manuals, model manuals started to advocate for behavior modification, to take off the excess weight by going on a diet or exercising in a way in the quest to be the ideal in the flesh without the help of foundation garments to create the desired silhouette, like girdles and waist cinchers and bullet bras and that sort of thing, diet pills, exercise machines, mood enhancers, and plastic surgery came into play as tools better suited to achieving the fashionable ideal. And there was actually a model manual that said plastic surgery should be an option considered by all wannabe models. So in this time frame, she is a little blurry. There's Jane Fonda doing her aerobics. In this time frame, the 1970s and 80s, actually, we also saw a rise of gym memberships, diet culture, and fitness as a desirable lifestyle for all. The changing discourses of women's rights, increased acceptance of bodily display, and the relaxing of sexual taboos helped modeling become more popular, widening the pools of, pool of those hoping to become models. And as a result, management could be pickier. And management hadn't always had this luxury. Back when being a model was something that you kind of kept a secret, your family wouldn't talk about it if one of the daughters was modeling. Uh, I looked back into the archives of modeling records, and I found several models that were on Powers' books. So John Robert Powers started the first American modeling agency in the 20s, and he was still at it in the 50s. But this is from, uh, I believe, 1932. Um, and this is a picture of Betty Marr. And she was in his annual where he has pictures of all his models on offer for the year with their measurements and their photograph. And she measured 35 inch bust, 29 inch waist, and 38 inch hips, which actually by modeling standards is huge. 
compared to today's girls who tend to be 37 inches and below or 33 or something ridiculous like that. Not 37, 34, 34, 24, 34 is actually almost big for a model. Um, so also in the 40s, there was Anita Cunahan who eventually became Anita, Anita Colby, who was known as the face, just like um, Frank Sinatra was known as the voice. She was the face, and due to her perfect features, she appeared on 15 magazine covers in a single month, in spite of having, and I quote, heavy legs and a thick figure. So things were very different prior to these changes that I'm describing, and I go into it more in detail in the book, but let's skip ahead to the 1980s, where the variety of body shapes and types evident in early modeling had fallen completely away, and a set of very narrowly defined statistics solidified into a classic, classic female fashion type. A 1984 manual was succinct. The girl model was five foot seven to five foot 11 inches with well-defined bone structure, wide set eyes, long legs, and a perfectly proportioned body. 1980s model manuals recommended more intense body surveillance and control, sharing far more detailed instructions for getting the model figure as we see here. We have pages and pages of instructions. No, don't just put a book on your head and walk around. There are actual um, step-by-steps for some pretty intense exercises. And these detailed instructions were accompanied with text that th said things like, and I quote, curves are not assets in fashion modeling. Excess weight could turn an agent off immediately. The idea that anybody not meeting the standards could be fixed, coupled with tightening entry requirements, caused a strange thing to happen in modeling. While the, while the idea gained currency that everyone who tried could or should be a model or just look like one, it seemed two opposite forces were at work. While the boundaries for entry became ever more narrow, tightening requirements met with the idea that looks mattered less than energy. The importance of projection spark attitude and hard work grew within the effective economics of the age of the blink. But what is the age of the blink? I mentioned it briefly before, and I just want to say this is an ad for a modeling school that was popular in the 80s where you didn't even have to be a model. You could just go to the school and look like a model. Um, so the age of the blink provides so many distractions and links to click or ideas to pursue. It creates a networked jumpiness where audiences flip from one image to the next with little time for conscious reflection and at times without registering what they actually see. Swipe right, swipe left. So basically this long chart is saying that in this economic climate, the value of the unpredictable became one of the reasons why so many people are constantly glued to their phones. And in fact, that's a business model to try to keep people engaged, keep people looking, keep people holding it dear, right? The little girls up front with their phones. Um, and now we can talk about more, but I put this up there mostly because I mentioned again the gaze, the glance, and the blink. And this unpredictability is a very important aspect of the economics that we live in today. So starting in the 1990s, it's actually the age of the blink in the book I pegged starting in the 90s with the dawn of the internet age. To catch this fleeting attention, models became super, exposed in more places and in more ways than ever before. Modeling became the life outside of which one could never step as the cable networked everywhere all the time media followed these model celebrities every move. The outbreak of the internet also saw invitation-only fashion shows live streaming to the general public, and supermodels became household names. The growing value of the unpredictable encouraged the idea that everyone should be a model or just look like one, as global fashion became a thing and the nets for scouting new models were cast ever wider. As an affective industry, fashion affect is something very unpredictable, and in this kind of industry, fashion trends sweep everyone into their wake and then just as suddenly are gone. As mercurial and unpredictable as the weather, one model agent described it to me this way, you never know which way the breeze will be blowing each day. This uncertainty pushed contemporary modeling professionals toward adhering more tightly to quote unquote model standards while at the same time keeping an eye out for the unusual or quirky look that might be the next big thing. So for instance, Kate Moss fit the bill with her body, sort of. I mean, she was only 5'7", and that was a quirk the industry was willing to forgive in this new climate. And you could see in the lower right that she's on the runway, and she's like almost a head shorter than the other models. And yet she became a supermodel in her own right. As the super-networked public's jumpiness increased, the measures taken in the face of this affected volatility to ensure the marketability of, of a model's image became draconian. 
The manuals from the late 1990s into the 2000s exhibit this paradoxical mix between anything goes market, between an anything goes market with room for all types and an increasingly rigid limit at the points of entry. One 1999 guide was quite stern. I'm quoting from the manual. Weight is critical. You cannot weigh more than 115 pounds, and that should be on the tallest frame. Most of the models weigh around 110 to 115, and your weight has to stay consistent. Another said, you must not have any bulges or even any visible bumps. Long and slender is the guide. Arms, legs, torso, and neck should be as lean as the proverbial racehorse. At the same time, however, this guide also pointed out the more projection a model has, the better the look of that person will be remembered, and that's what will make the hourly rate skyrocket. So we have a new layer here. It's not just about the physique. It's about how the model projects energy. The projection was not the only new, newly valuable form of affective volatility or changeability. The body's physical potential to change became valuable as well in this new climate. While photo retouching has been a given in fashion photography for forever, they've always retouched the images, after the 1990s, Photoshop took off, and pixelated thighs were shaved thinner, splotches erased, pores and under-eye circles and wayward hairs magically disappeared. Since the look could be achieved only through technological manipulation, this new digital unreal created a tension between the fashion images in circulation and the people they supposedly represented resulting in an even stronger push for models to seek to embody an ever more narrowly defined and some might argue impossible look. As one model agent told then model of the Audis Coco Rocha when she weighed just 108 pounds, you need to lose more weight. The look this year is anorexic. We don't want you to be anorexic. We just want you to look it. And there she is. I don't know if this one's photoshopped, but she's looking quite slender in that image. But despite this tendency toward an, atten an intense lower limit on models' body size, there was no one ideal according to the models I spoke to for the book. I interviewed a bunch of models, as I mentioned before. Instead, they spoke of what sociologist Ashley Mears has dubbed floating norms, that is, rules of behavior that are so changeable that on any given day, it's anyone's guess which look the clients will desire. In the face of these fashionable whims, the models I interviewed, and we're almost done, the models I interviewed were encouraged to think of themselves as potentially lucrative makeovers in the making. Would-be models were encouraged to think of their bodies as something to be ever more thoroughly managed and constantly changed. And at the same time, they were taught to think of themselves as independent entrepreneurs in charge of their own business where personality and pizzazz were all that mattered in the process of constant self-fashioning. From Twiggy's era onward, the pull for regular people to enter the rhythms of fashion amplified, as did the idea that everyone should do their glamour labor to be ready for their close-up while marshalling their energy to project the right image at all times. The mobile phone camera became the paradigmatic example of the everywhere all the time photography that characterizes our moment and newly defines the fashionable ideal, which is now becoming the worked on, worked over, worked up and constantly exposed image. And here we have somebody who's very good with her selfies. She's doing her glamour labor. She's building her brand. And she's doing all the work for herself. She's acting as if she's a model, even if she's not. So how did regular people begin to think they should act like models? As I found in my study, one of the main job descriptions for a fashion model is to make the look, the work of exposure like fun. With the rise of the amateur fashion, fashion, with the rise of amateur fashion in the blogosphere, the street has become the runway for many living in urban centers. The life promoted by models' glamour labor of constant self-promotion and fashioning is becoming something few can escape in the rise of social media culture. So in our self-branding social media on steroids image economy, the fashionable ideal invokes an image that promotes connection and constant self-branding. When models like Cara Delevingne and Gigi Haddad express breezy health self conviction Crazy self-confessional confidences on social media, their glossy girlfriendy rapport of behind-the-scenes snaps and how-to videos, model a lifestyle that encourages constant work on the look, and this look has become a key component of the current fashionable ideal. So we see here they look like they're at a slumber party, they're in their PJs, they're just girls hanging out, and they happen to be famous models who get zillions of followers on their Instagram feed. It looks like she's cutting her hair. I hope that didn't happen. So in our selfie society, the idea that everybody should try to fit the model norm is coming into full flower. 
But this new inclusiveness is shifting the ideal once again, rather than thinking there are various types of bodies and there isn't much to be done about it. The work to achieve the look, whatever it is, is becoming valuable. The message became anyone can do it if they work hard enough. Any body can become fashionable in the digitized world. And here we have, again, the imitation of the celebrity. And this time, she'd probably work for hours to produce the Kim Kardashian look. And I just figured it might be nice to block out the, the bits. Um, so in the proliferation of, and this is like my third to last slide, in the proliferation of the selfie-obsessed, at-no-filter culture, these pressures are spreading. And it's not just about young girls stuck facing in the bathroom. In the sharing economy that has led, this sharing economy is taking on and doing things for yourself, has led some tr to try to break through fashion's barriers to entry, using the free-for-all form of the internet to carve a new path to social acceptance and visibility. While fashion blogging seems to have exploded models' skinny grip on the ideal, I argue that in fact the wider variety of bodies we now see as fashionable is not just political correctness, although I, I laud this change where people who were excluded from being in fashion have been able to find a voice and a place for themselves through fat acceptance and fatchin is a term that was bandied about for some time, um, and these are three fashion bloggers who were part of that change. Rather than upholding one ideal as the most desirable, in the age of the blink, morphing bodies are making news. Is this good news? Are these the poster children for a coming gender fluid transhuman age? This is the Barney's campaign with the transgender models, by the way, from a, a little while back. Is there a message of inclusiveness or is it just an opening for new revenue streams? Models have long worked hard to appear as though they live the fabulously fashiony lifestyle for the camera. As entrepreneurs of You Inc., they produced their image for the camera, tried to be their best self in the flesh, and these practices have been sold to the general public as a road to profit. Increasingly, opting out of having a public image or feed seems no longer a choice. For some, it has become an economic necessity, and there are millennials who are think finding and trying to make a living on Instagram and Snapchat and YouTube. Um, and there are lots of articles about how this can be done. Now, not that many people succeed in doing this, although these are some successful fashion bloggers. While producing a valuable look was once just a model's game, now everybody who manages an Instagram feed or Snapchat stories is playing by the same rules. Manage yourself, manage your images, be your best self, stay on brand. And in this cultural moment, this kind of innovation is highly valued. Disruption is the name of the game. Perhaps these disruptors of the fashionable look can lead the way to a more inclusive, less destructive idea, idea of the ideal look and lifestyle. Moving toward concluding, I hope these remarks and the book can delineate at least in part the complexity and the importance of understanding the power of the fashionable look to better understand it and perhaps loosen its hold on our collective psyches and the powerful mix of pleasure and exploitation at the heart of these processes Make them hard to dismantle or even resist, but it is my sincere hope that this book's provocations highlight a path toward a saner, more habitable direction, one that is fashioned forward without leaving anyone behind. I've just been handed a few questions. So, um, oh my, some of them are hard to read. Um, everybody just do the seventh inning stretch. Uh, okay, let me try this one. Do you see a shift coming along in the ideal body type for models anytime soon? Now that more pressure is put on companies to use models as a healthier, with a healthier physique. I would say, yes, I think so. Because part of what I've been trying to understand here today and in the book is how is it that separate forces that don't seem to have anything to do with each other can actually come together and make a change that looks like it's wonderful and it came from the political activism, but 
as a sociologist, I also know that sometimes change can't happen until the social structures and social forces around that change make it possible. But I think even if we're not seeing it that much, I mean, the model agents that I interviewed, many of them were saying, we're on the cutting edge of social change. And they often see things before, people who are on the edge of fashion see things before the rest of us do. Um, so I hope that yes, that this type will change. And if it, one of them said, if it makes money for people, it's gonna happen. So if somebody makes money from it, great. And if we have more healthy images out there that don't inspire eating disorders or pro-ana websites or any of that, that would be great too. Why do you think so many people today are captivated by the dream of being a model? And what is the future of modeling? Those are both interesting. Um, I think part of the allure of modeling, I mean, I have another section in the book where I talk about um, disappearing opportunity for young people and how there have been studies that have shown that many young people's uh, television shows or books they're reading, often the plot centers around the child or the teenager becoming famous. And there are so many reality shows on television that center around an ordinary person suddenly becoming famous. And in fact, on YouTube and Instagram, that happens to ordinary people. Um, people who want to not only just be a model, but they want to have an image in the public eye. And when there is disappe disappearing opportunity elsewhere, why is becoming famous such a ridiculous dream? Plus, with modeling in particular, like if you want to be a singer or a rock and roll star or somebody who's a sports star, you actually have to have a skill. And what people don't realize is that modeling's not easy at all. They think, if I'm attractive, I can be a model. I'll just smile. But there's a lot of work involved that people are unaware, with, unaware of. So I think it makes it a, a really attractive dream. Plus, we have that story. It used to be everyone wanted to be the movie star because they'd get uh, discovered at the soda fountain. And now it's I'm walking down the street in Soho, and somebody discovers me and puts them on their Instagram blog and street style blog, and suddenly I'm getting paid to um, become a model. So I think that's partly why it's the dream. But I do think the future of modeling is an interesting question because I do see people doing modeling who aren't going through the regular route of modeling or they start modeling before they become models and they get 59,000 Instagram followers and then suddenly they're modeling for Calvin Klein. So I think that just happened to, um, I'm going to say his name wrong, Smith, Jada Pinkett's son. Jada Pinkett's son, Smith's son. Jaden, Jaden's his name. His girlfriend has a zillion Instagram followers and all of a sudden she's a model. So it's interesting how uh, modeling used to work where people were pulled into the industry and then made into models and now it seems that's being kind of outsourced to regular people who are becoming models and then being pulled into the industry. Um, so I think it will still go on, but it is definitely changing. I got a couple more questions. Are we, do we have patience for a couple more questions? Are we okay? Um, uh, this is really long. Oh, Roland Barthes, I love it. Uh, so as you wrote, I'll just read it out. As you were speaking about the fashionable ideal, or the fashionable, I began to think about Camera Lucida, Roland Barthes, and Roland Barthes' piece, Camera Lucida, where he says that the body changes and moves and poses become different in front of the camera. Do you find, or did you find, that these ideal bodies changed and became different in front of the camera? That's a really interesting question. Um, I did notice that the models I interviewed became different in front of the camera. I was just remembering today when I was interviewing a very gorgeous, very tall, very dark-skinned African-American, I think he was, or African-African model in a Starbucks, and he was trying to explain to me about what he does when he gets on the runway. So this is not exactly for the camera, but it's when he puts on his model persona. And all of a sudden, he leapt up, and he just started slithering around the coffee shop, and I was like, oh my god, what is going on here? And he became a completely different person. And it was really fascinating to me to see how he was able to transform into this other thing, which he knew had the look. And I think that is part of the work of modeling that is important to understand. And we do see people doing that now who are being models in their own world of being photographed for their Instagram feed or their Snapchat or whatever it is. So I think that's a really interesting and important question to think about. Uh, and the other one said, 
Oh dear, yes. Could you speak on the women magazine editors whose role, who play a role in perpetrating and disseminating ideals of beauty and fashionability? So how could women get involved in perpetrating images that could possibly hurt young girls? Um, I can't believe I'm going to tell this story. Uh, I had the good or perhaps bad fortune of being interviewed for European television recently. And um, when I was tapped to do the interview, uh, all they told me is that we want you to say a few words about fashion and fat. Is, why is fat taboo in fashion? So I did a sort of positive few comments, which then they voiced over in French. And I ended with the idea that things might not look like they're changing, but we do have Barbie dolls coming in several different sizes now, and the children are clapping, yay, for the curvy bar Barbie, right? So I was saying, if you, you know, perhaps in the future there might be a place for uh, the curvy fashionistas to take their place next to their skinnier sisters, and there might be space for all types of bodies to be fashionable and acceptable and esteemed and revered and looked at as beautiful. And the interview got cut into this other interview <laughs> where the, the newscasters were interviewing the, um, the woman who wrote Jamais Assez Maigre, uh, Maigre, excuse me, Jamais Assez Maigre, I hope I'm saying it correctly. Simone, you can tell me if I said that right. Does that mean never skinny enough? Yeah. So they were interviewing her, and she was very angry at the industry, and she was saying, how can women who are in the industry perpetrate these horrible practices and put forth these damaging images, and then they cut to an editor from Elle magazine that they, I assume they had similarly ambushed. Um, although what she said was really interesting. So she's outside the tents in Fashion Week, it's an editor of Elle magazine, and they said, what do you think of these damaging skinny images that the industry puts forth? And she said, well, you know, a lot of the girls are naturally thin, which I don't know. I mean, I think we could talk more about it maybe over drinks later or whatever. I mean, but in short, I mean, if it, it is more common, I believe, when you're under a certain age as a young woman in your teens that your body hasn't filled out yet. So it is a skinnier physique. And then if you're working in a field where I just thought Charlie, the model that I said I saw interviewed where she was talking about the damaging experience of being in the industry, she was saying part, part of the problem is that when you're inside of it, you can't see that what's going on is off, if that makes any sense. So you can't see that everyone around you is unnaturally thin, especially if you're the one that's being called the big girl because you happen to have a breast size of 35 or something like that. So you, and I remember when I was doing my field work that at one point it was like 90 million degrees and I was standing outside, it was hot July summer afternoon, I was standing outside of casting and the models were coming out. And I was trying to like say, hey, I'm a sociologist, can I interview you? Which was kind of a difficult proposition, but it turned into a great day because I met a model who took me to her model apartment. I interviewed all the girls there and it was fantastic. But in that moment, I got a sense of what it might be like to be in this world where everybody is a certain height, a certain physique, a certain bone structure, a certain way of looking that if that becomes your norm, Maybe you can't see that what you're doing might be damaging. You're doing what's edgy, what's fashionable, what's cool. So I don't know if we should be so harsh on the editors who are in a field who it's, as a sociologist, I always say it's structure, not agency, right? It's the structure that's out there that needs to be changed. The people in it are not necessarily bad, but if the structure is bad, we need to change the structure. So that is what I make of these women who are perpetrating these images. And I, I think this will be the last question. Is that right? Oh, I have one more. Uh, this is the last one. I hope I didn't miss anyone. Sorry if I did. I promise I'll answer it when I sign the book. Um, Barbie and Mattel have come out with the real size Barbie, yet some feedback is not positive. Is this a parallel to what might happen to the model world? Oh, that is an interesting question, too. I don't, I don't think that we can really answer that question definitely. Uh, in my opinion of having thought about it for a long time, I do think it's possible for this change to occur, but I don't think it'll happen smoothly and easily. So yeah, just like 
they were calling her Fat Barbie. I don't know. Did anyone ever say that? <laughs> no, we love curvy Barbie, right? Um, but there was some pushback and there was some flack about it. Uh, I think that in trying to open up this, this image has been around as considered fashionable, the slender, some scholars call it the parasexual image, meaning it, it looks sexual, but there's no real steam or meat in it. It's just an, a, kind of a shadow of sexuality. That look is, is embranded in our cultural understandings of the fashionable body so deeply that it's going to take a long time and a lot of showing of different images and acceptance for it to change. But I do think that if it, if it can make money, it will change. And I think people are more ready for it now than they were. So I do think there is hope for uh, changing this rigid ideal. And uh, I think the fact that all of these different types of bodies are showing up in ad campaigns are the cutting edge of, so of something new. So I'm happy to answer any further questions. I'll be up stairs at the book table, but I think that we've done a great job of it tonight, and I thank you all for coming.